Our story today is titled, Rescuing Runaways. Let me begin by quoting a verse taken from the Psalms. It says, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That's Psalm 139, verses 9 and 10. Sometimes parents come to me, and they're quite frantic, and they say, my son or my daughter, they've moved to L.A., or they've moved to New York, or London, or wherever. And the impression you get is that they're actually running away from the Lord, running away from the gospel. And they seem quite disturbed by this. And I have to tell them, you know what? God's in New York, too. <laughs> He's in L.A., too. It seems David understands that the limiting speed in the universe is the speed of light. And he says, in our modern paraphrase, if, if I jump on the first ray of light that comes over the horizon when the sun is rising, and I travel 186,000 miles a second to Bora Bora in the middle of the Pacific, when I arrived, God would say, welcome. I've been waiting for you. And so the whole idea of running away from God, right? Jonah finds this out. He takes his Mediterranean cruise instead of going and doing what the Lord wanted him to do. And he has to make this ridiculous confession that he's running away from the God he worships, who is the God of land and sea. So he left the land and ran away to sea to avoid the God of the land and the sea. Well, you can't run away from a God like that. And God loves our kids more than we do. He loves those runaways more than we do. And he has agents everywhere. So I want to tell you two stories. And they both have to do with one street in one town. The town is St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. That's where I grew up. And the street is Russell Avenue. And Russell Avenue is a fairly long street in the city. And uh, at one end of it is, at the corner, is a house where my great-grandmother lived and uh, on my mother's side. And uh, my great-grandmother had a daughter, Ruth. And... Uh, Ruth was a sister to my grandmother. Well, um, there was a man who grew up in a very wealthy home in England. His father was landed gentry. He had a huge estate, beautiful big manor home, and, uh, and he loved the Lord. And every year he would put up a gospel tent on their estate and invite all the villagers from the villages around to come and hear the gospel. Well, Frank, that was his name, Frank had enough of the gospel, and he decided to flee the home because he wanted to get away from the gospel. And so he left England, he came to Canada, and now he had to get a job. And he'd never really done hard labor, and the only job available he could find was picking fruit in a fruit orchard. Our whole area is surrounded by fruit trees, and so he began picking, I don't know what it was, peaches or apples, and up and down the, the ladders, climbing and hefting these big baskets of fruit. And he was totally exhausted, his back aching, his legs aching. He wasn't used to hard labor, and, uh, and he was just exhausted. He thought, I've got to find something better than this. And so he began looking through the classifieds, and he found an ad for a job working in a tool shop, uh, working at a lathe, and he thought, I could do that. And so he went and applied for the job, and sure enough, he got it. When they set him up at his machine, it was just about lunchtime by the time he got ready to work, and as he looked across, here was a man just in his direct line of vision who was sitting at his machine, and he had his lunch, and he had an open Bible. And he was reading the Bible, and he was eating his lunch. And when he was finished his lunch, there was still a little bit of time left, he walked over to Frank and said, welcome to Canada. I want to be your friend. If there's anything I can do to help. 
and I'd like you to come to my home for supper. Well, you know, Frank hadn't had a home-cooked meal since he'd left England, and he came to supper, and, uh, and the man said, you know, no pressure, but we're going out this evening to hear the gospel. And Frank realized, God has chased me all the way to St. Catharines, Ontario. <laughs> and he went out and he heard the gospel and Frank put his trust in the Lord Jesus. That man eventually became his brother-in-law, Bill Burdett. And, uh, and Frank married my great aunt and they lived in that house where my great-grandmother lived on the one end of Russell Avenue. The fact was that my uncle Frank, that his parents, their prayers chased him right across, halfway across the world. And there he was arriving in that tool shop and God already had his agent sitting there right in front of him. A little further down Russell Avenue, by the way, my grandfather had a grocery store on Russell Avenue for 43 years. But a little further down the road was the McEntee household. And Vernon McEntee and my grandfather Robertson were two young men who, after the First World War, were left with a little local church full of young widows and children. All of their husbands, who had been the original, the elders in that local church, uh, had been conscientious objectors because they wouldn't bear arms and they were sent off to a labor camp in northern Canada, and they all died of the Spanish flu, the, the epidemic. None of them came home. And so my grandfather, who was just, I think, 22 at the time, and Vern McIntyre, they became the young elders of that fledgling local church. Well, Vern had three boys, and, um, and one of them was Arnett. Arnett was named after the great uh, missionary, Fred Stanley Arnett. I have a picture, a painting of him in my, in my office. He's one of my heroes. And Arnett was not saved. And he had um, gone into the Air Force. And, um, and Mr. McIntyre took Arnett down to the train station. And as he waved goodbye, he just broke his heart. He wept as he watched his son leave. And he thought, I may never see my son again. Going off to war, he could die in battle, and Arnett's not saved. Well, Arnett traveled by train all the way across Canada. I don't know how far it is from Ontario to Vancouver, but 2,500, 3,000 miles, I don't know how far it is. He arrived in Vancouver, went to the base, was given his digs, uh, went to the Quonset hut, put his stuff away, sat down on the bed. A man walked in, came over to him, and invited him for supper, and said, I'd like you to come out with me to hear the gospel. The man who was preaching was a man who had stayed in their home in St. Catharines, Robert McClurkin. And Robert McClurkin preached the gospel to Arnett, the same gospel he'd heard growing up. And Arnett put his trust in the Lord Jesus. He realized you can't run away from God. The God who is everywhere was waiting for Arnett. And we have to realize this, folks. The Lord has a lot more invested. If you have a wayward child, he loves your child more than you do. He has more invested in them than you do. Christ died for them. The Spirit is working in their heart. And you just need to allow God to carry on. And they may run away, but what we hope and what we should pray is, Lord, when they come to the end of themselves, when, like the prodigal, they're sitting in the pigsty and their friends have abandoned them, may they have happy thoughts about the Father's house. May they long to come home. And I'm just praying that, that some of you will get a phone call from a prodigal somewhere today or this week, and they'll say, I've come to the Lord. Well, let me, let me finish um, with the story. Uh, Robert McClurkin, um, after, after Arnett got saved, he sat down and he wrote a letter to Vernon McIntyre back 
on Russell Avenue in St. Catharines. And he quoted this verse from Philemon 1 and 15, which is speaking about Onesimus. And he's writing back to Philemon. um, And he says, For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. God knows how to rescue runaways. And I trust that you will be encouraged by this and lay hold of God in prayer for your wayward child or grandchild and know that God loves them. And wherever they are right now, as Paul would say to the folks at Mars Hill, he is not far from every one of us. He's as close as a prayer. Pray that God will resurrect the truth in their hearts as they've learned it before as a child. Pray that he will bring agents into their lives, people they'll admire, people who love the Lord and who are wise and who, and who are able to reinforce the things that they've heard in the past. Like these two men who invited, invited these prodigals home for dinner and then shared Christ with them. Pray that they'll feel filthy in their sin. They'll feel like they're in a pigsty and that the far country will lose its allure. And pray that they'll have the courage to come home. And I think God can work in a mighty way in the lives of these prodigals, these runaways, because he's in the business of rescuing runaways. Runaways. 